Chapter 5. Danny Casalaro. August 10, 1991, Martinsburg, Virginia. Danny Casalaro's body was found at 12.30 p.m. in a blood-filled bathtub by a hotel maid who called the Martinsburg police. The body contained three deep cuts on the right wrist and seven on the left wrist, made by a single-edged razor blade, the kind used to scrape windows or open packages. At the bottom of the bath water was an empty Milwaukee beer can, a paper glass coaster, the razor blade and two white plastic trash bags, the kind used in waste paper baskets. On the desk in the hotel room was an empty mead composition notebook with one page torn out and a suicide note which read, To those who I love the most, please forgive me for the worst possible thing I could have done. Most of all, I'm sorry to my son. I know deep down inside that God will let me in. Casalaro was a Catholic whose religion teaches that it is a sin to commit suicide. Friends wondered if the words God will let me in was a coded message that he did not take his own life. And why would a writer who loved language leave such a short, cryptic note? There were no other papers, folders, documents of any sort, nor any briefcase found at the death scene. Danny's wallet was intact, stuffed with credit cards. The body was removed from the tub by Lieutenant Dave Brining from the Martinsburg Fire Department, and his wife, Sandra, a nurse who works in the hospital emergency room. The couple, who often moonlighted as coroners, took the body to the Brown Funeral Home where they conducted an examination. Charles Brown then decided to embalm the body that night and go home, rather than come back to work the next day, Sunday. No one in Danny's family had been notified of his death at that time, nor had they requested the body be embalmed. When Casalaro's family learned of the death, they insisted it was not a suicide and called for an autopsy and an investigation. Danny's brother, Dr. Anthony Casalaro, publicly stated his disbelief that his high-spirited, gregarious brother could have committed suicide. Danny was so afraid of blood, he said, that he refused to allow samples to be drawn for medical purposes, and would never have chosen to slash his veins a dozen times. Moreover, Danny had a life filled with friends and a close-knit Italian Catholic family. He was known in private circles as an upbeat, golden-haired romantic who loved to quote poetry, raised Arabian horses, and was adored by women. Though Danny's body had already been embalmed, an autopsy was performed at the West Virginia University Hospital by a Dr. Frost. The findings indicated that no struggle had taken place because there were no recent bruises on the body. The drugs found in Casalaro's urine, blood and tissue samples were in minute amounts but they were also unexplainable by his brother, Tony, who is a medical doctor. According to Tony Casalaro, Danny did not take drugs or have any prescriptions for the drug traces of hydrocotone and tricyclic antidepressant that were found in the body. No pill boxes or written prescriptions were found. Dr. Casalaro searched through his brother's Blue Cross records and found no record of the prescriptions or doctor visits. During the autopsy of the body, Dr. Frost had found lesions within the brain which were characteristic of multiple sclerosis. It was possible that Danny was having blurring of vision, but Dr. Frost downplayed the possibility that this contributed to any suicide. Of particular interest, was Frost's observation that the deep razor wounds on Danny's wrists were inflicted without any hesitation marks. However, the lack of hesitation did not indicate one way or the other whether they were or were not self-inflicted. Investigators and police never found Danny's missing briefcase. On August 6, 1991, Casalaro's housekeeper, Olga, helped Danny pack a black leather tote bag. She remembered he also packed a thick sheaf of papers into a dark brown or black briefcase. She asked him what he had put into the briefcase and he replied, I have all my papers. He had been typing for two days, and as he left the house, he said, Wish me luck. I'll see you in a couple of days. By August 9, Casalaro's friends were alarmed. No one had heard from him and Olga was receiving threatening phone calls at Danny's home. On Saturday, August 10, Olga received another call, a man's voice said, You son of a bitch. You're dead. After learning of Danny's death, Olga recalled seeing Danny sitting in the kitchen on August 5 with a heavy man. Wearing a dark suit. He was a dark man with black hair, he turned towards the door, I saw he was dark-skinned. 
I told police maybe he could be from India. At 3 o'clock p.m. on Friday, the day before Danny's death, Bill Turner, a friend and confidant, met Danny in the parking lot of the Sheraton Hotel to deliver some papers to him. The papers allegedly consisted of two sealed packages which Turner had been keeping in his safe at home for Danny, and a packet of Hughes aircraft papers which belonged to Turner who had been let go from Hughes for whistle-blowing. Danny had appeared exuberant to most of his friends before his death, noting that he was about to wrap up his investigation of the octopus. He had originally been trying to prove that the alleged theft of the Inslaw computer program, Promise, was related to the October surprise scandal, the Iran-Contra affair and the collapse of BCCI, Bank of Credit and Commerce International. Turner later admitted to police that he had indeed met with Danny on August 9, but at that time he refused to specify what time and would not describe what was in the papers he delivered to Danny. I later learned that Turner had been investigating discrepancies involving his former employer, Hughes Aircraft Company. The documents he had delivered from his safe to Danny had been sealed, with Casalaro's name written across the seal, and he claimed not to have known what they contained. Nevertheless, it is feasible to assume that Turner may have known who Danny was preparing to meet that evening at the Martinsburg Hotel because, for reasons of his own, Turner apparently wanted Danny to show the Hughes aircraft documents to whoever he was meeting with. Turner later noted to reporters that he was scared shitless about information he had seen connecting Ollie North and BCCI. I saw papers from Danny that connected back through the Keating 5 and Silverado, the failed Denver S and L where Neil Bush had been an officer, he said. To his friend, Ben Mason, Danny showed a 22-point outline for his book. Included in the information he shared with Mason were papers referring to Iran-Contra arms deals. Photocopies of checks made out for $1 million and $4 million drawn on BCCI accounts held for Adnan Kazoghi, an international arms merchant and factotum for the House of Sword, and by Manukka Gorbanifa, an arms dealer and Iran-Contra middleman, were presented. The last sheet, noted Mason, was a passport of some guy named Ibrahim. Casalaro had emphasized that Ibrahim had made a big deal of showing him, Casalaro, his Egyptian passport. Ibrahim was obviously the informant whom Olga, Casalaro's housekeeper, had seen sitting in the kitchen with Danny on August 5. Hassan Ali Ibrahim Ali, born in 1928, was later identified as the manager of Citico, an alleged Iraqi front company for arms purchases. Casalaro had obtained these papers from his confidant. Bob Bickle, who in turn obtained them from October Surprise source Richard Brannock. Neither Danny or Bob Bickle were aware at the time of a document from the U.S. Department of Justice, dated May 16, 1985, written by William Bradford Reynolds, Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division, to William F. Weld, United States Attorney in Boston, Massachusetts, advising Mr. Weld that the promise, e. Software was being provided to an Arab sheik for resale and general distribution in his region. The letter read as follows, Dear Mr. Weld, as agreed Messrs. Manager, Sig Orbanifer, Adnan Kazoghi, and Richard Armitage will broker the transaction of Promise Software to Sheik Khalid bin Mahfouz for resale and general distribution as gifts in his region contingent upon the three conditions we last spoke of. Promise must have a soft arrival. No paperwork customs, or delay. It must be equipped with a special data retrieval unit. As before, you must walk the financial aspects through Credit Suisse International Commercial Bank. If you encounter any problems contact me directly. Sincerely, W.M. Bradford Reynolds, Assistant Attorney General, Civil Rights Division. Bill Hamilton, owner of Inslaw said he had had received this document in the mail in November 2004 from a consistently reliable U.S. intelligence source. He said Donald Carr showed the document to Bradford Reynolds in 2005. Carr was writing a biography of Elliot Richardson and served with Reynolds in the Edwin Mies and Richard Thornburg Justice Departments as a Republican political appointee. Reynolds authenticated the document. He told Carr that Lowell Jensen's secretary brought the letter to him for signature because Jensen was out of the building, the letter needed to be sent that day, and it needed to be signed by someone in Edwin Mies's inner circle. He said he signed the letter but did not draft it. 
Reynolds said he had a vague recollection the Mies recused himself from promise when he became Attorney General in February 1985 and Jensen had, therefore, to handle promise. Reynolds told Carr that he had an independent memory of Armitage, Kazogi, and Gorbana for working together on promise. Hamilton said it was a very important letter. The source who sent it to him in November 2004 told him that all copies were supposed to have been destroyed but obviously were not. Adnan Kazogi's sister, Samira Kazogi Fayed, was the mother of Dodi Fayed, an Egyptian multi-millionaire film producer who was romantically involved with Diana, Princess of Wales. In the early hours of August 31, 1997, the couple died in a car crash in a Paris underpass. A shrewd businessman, Kazogi covered his financial tracks by establishing front companies in Switzerland and Liechtenstein to handle his commissions as well as developing contacts with notables such as CIA officers James H. Critchfield and Kim Roosevelt and as businessman Bib Rebozo, a close associate of former US President Richard Nixon. He was considered the richest man in the world in the 1980s. His sister married Mohammed El Fayed, father of Dodi Fayed. His yacht, Nabila, was the largest in the world at the time and was used in the James Bond film Never Say Never Again. Adnan Kazoghi was implicated in the Iran Contra affair as a key middleman in the arms for hostages exchange along with Iranian arms dealer Manukka Gorbanifer and, in a complex series of events, was found to have borrowed money for these arms purchases from the now bankrupt financial institution the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, with Saudi Indus backing. In 1988, Kazogi was arrested in Switzerland, accused of concealing funds, held for three months and then extradited to the United States where he was released on bail and subsequently acquitted. In 1990, a United States federal jury in Manhattan acquitted Kazogi and Imelda Marcos, widow of the exiled Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos, of racketeering and fraud. Ari Ben Monash, a self-proclaimed Israeli military intelligence officer was responsible for the tip-off to an obscure Lebanese magazine about what later became known as the Iran-Contra scandal. After Casalaro's death, Monash called Bill Hamilton, the president of Insular Company and creator of the Promise software. Hamilton had been in daily contact with Casalaro until about a week prior to his death. Monash claimed that two FBI agents from Lexington, Kentucky, had embarked on a trip to Martinsburg to meet Casalaro as part of their investigation of the sale of the Promise software to Israel and other intelligence agencies. Ben Menashe told Hamilton that one of the FBI agents, E.B. Cartin Hall, was disaffected because his superiors had refused to indict high Reagan officials for their role in the October surprise. Ben Menashe claimed the agents were prepared to give Casalaro proof that the FBI was illegally using Promise software. It is highly unlikely that the two FBI agents were en route to Martinsburg to give anything to Casalaro, but they may well have been on their way to obtain his documents and those belonging to Bill Turner. If, in fact, Danny had disclosed to any one of the many sources he had developed during his investigation, that he was turning over his documents to the Lexington FBI, that may well have alarmed a few of them. I was able to validate that Casalaro had contacted the FBI in Lexington, Kentucky through an inquiry to that office. They said they had been en route to meet with Danny, but turned around and went back to Lexington when they learned of his death. A source of information which Danny may have read, Dark Victory, Ronald Reagan, MCA, and The Mob, by Dan E. Moldia, could have been the inspiration behind Danny's identification of the octopus, and it would have corroborated some of Danny's findings in his own investigation. Dan Moldia called this unholy alliance the octopus in his 1986 book. Casalaro was also investigating Colonel Bo Gritz's expose of CIA drug trafficking in the Golden Triangle, and had requested to meet with a former police officer who had information on Laotian Warlord Kun Zar's Golden Triangle drug trade proposal to the U.S. Gritz had staged several expeditions to Laos in search of missing POWs, but reportedly stumbled upon a massive drug network in Southeast Asia and American POWs were intertwined in that network, he told the Sacramento Bee, June 6, 1987. Gritz had been indicted in May 1987 for using a false passport in the name of Patrick Richard Clark from Vancouver, Canada, 
but at his arraignment before a U.S. magistrate in Las Vegas he said he had proper authorization for his travels. Casalaro also learned through a Sacramento Bee newspaper article, dated June 2, 1990 that Patrick Moriarty, the Red Devil fireworks magnet convicted of laundering political contributions and bribing city officials in Sacramento, had been subpoenaed to testify on behalf of Gritz at his trial in Las Vegas. Gritz was acquitted of the charges. Moriarty's lawyer, Jan Lawrence Hansleek, told the Bee that Moriarty had paid Gritz to make business trips to China, Singapore and other parts of Asia. Gritz said his business trip to Asia in July 1989 was for the purpose of negotiating an oil interest that he and Moriarty had set up between the People's Republic of China and Indonesia. At the time of Gritz's trial, Patrick Moriarty was the longtime, 30 years, partner of Marshall Reconosciuto, Michael Reconosciuto's father. They owned several California businesses together, two of which were Hercules Research Corporation, of which Michael was a partner, and Pyrotronics Corporation. I privately mused after reading the B article that Michael Hand, before he founded Nugent Hand Bank in Australia with Frank Nugent and officials of the CIA-owned Air America, had been a highly decorated Special Forces Green Beret soldier in Vietnam. Colonel Bo Gritz was also a highly decorated Green Beret in Vietnam, and both Gritz and Hand had special knowledge of intelligence operations in the Golden Triangle. After his first stint in Vietnam, Hand moved to the clandestine CIA war in Laos, according to a former station chief in Indochina, Ted Shackley. The Nugent Hand Bank, a primary CIA operation in the Pacific area, reportedly laundered profits from drug trafficking in the Golden Triangle which, in turn, financed subversive paramilitary activities in Southeast Asia. In 1980 the Nugent Hand Bank collapsed, $5 billion in debt, and Michael Hand disappeared. In the book The Crimes of Patriots by Jonathan Quitney, Michael Hand reportedly fled Australia under a false identity on June 14, 1980 on a flight to Fiji. He was helped to escape by an American codenamed Charlie, identified by Quitney as a former member of the U.S. Special Forces and ex-CIA operative. In 1991, top Australian journalist Brian Toohey reported in his The Eye magazine that Michael Hand had a postal drop at a suite in N.E. Bellevue, Washington State. Han's wife was reportedly living with him there. I found this particularly interesting because Michael Reconosciuto had been living near Tacoma, Washington State when he was arrested in 1991. During our subsequent phone conversations, he said he had been in direct communication with Michael Hand before and after Han's disappearance, and that he had handled money transfers for Hand when he fled Australia. Another tentacle of Casalaro's octopus investigation involved the Wakanet Cabazan joint venture. At one time he considered the title of Indio for the book he was writing. His death occurred just days before he planned to visit the Cabazan Indian Reservation near Indio, California. Though his notes did not divulge what role the Cabazans may have had in the conspiracy, Casalaro listed Dr. John Philip Nichols, the Cabazan administrator, as a former CIA agent. Numerous publications reporting on Casalaro's death corroborated that one of his sources included Michael Reconosciuto, dubbed a 44-year-old former high-tech scientist who had connections with Wakenet Corporation. What brought Casalaro to Reconosciuto was an affidavit signed by Reconosciuto claiming that when he worked on the Wakenet Cabazan project, he was given a copy of the Inslaw software by L. Bryan for modification. Reconosciuto also swore that Peter Vidanix, a Justice Department official associated with the Inslaw contract, had visited the Wakenet Cabazan project with Earl Bryan. Earl Bryan was a businessman and Edwin Meese crony who served in Governor Ronald Reagan's cabinet in California. The $6 million in software stolen from William and Nancy Hamilton, co-owners of Inslaw Company, was allegedly sold by the Justice Department through Earl Bryan to raise off the book's money for covered government operations. On May 18, 1990, Reconosciuto had called the Hamiltons and informed them that the Inslaw case was connected to the October Surprise Affair. Reconosciuto claimed that he and Earl Bryan had traveled to Iran in 1980 and paid $40 million to Iranian officials to persuade them not to release the hostages before the presidential election in which Reagan became President of the United States. 
Reconosciuto's information created a domino effect in Washington, D.C., opening numerous investigations and causing a media blitz. At that time, Casolaro was involved in the Hamilton's private investigation of the theft of their software and he had regular communication with Reconosciuto. Former U.S. Attorney General Elliot Richardson, the Hamilton's attorney, subsequently sent Reconosciuto an affidavit to sign, to be filed by Inslaw in federal court in connection with Inslaw's pending motion for limited discovery. The affidavit, dated March 21, 1991, Case number 85-00070 entered into court records, resulted in Reconosciuto's arrest within eight days. It read as follows, I Michael J. Reconosciuto, being duly sworn, do hereby state as follows, 1. During the early 1980s, I served as the director of research for a joint venture between the Wakenet Corporation of Coral Gables, Florida, and the Cabazan Band of Indians of Indio, California. The joint venture was located on the Cabazan Reservation. 2. The Wakenet Cabazan joint venture sought to develop and or manufacture certain materials that are used in military and national security operations, including night vision goggles, machine guns, fuel air explosives, and biological and chemical warfare weapons. 3. The Cabazan Band of Indians are a sovereign nation. The sovereign immunity that is accorded the Cabazans as a consequence of this fact made it feasible to pursue on the reservation the development and or manufacture of materials whose development or manufacture would be subject to stringent controls off the reservation. As a minority group, the Cabazan Indians also provided the Wakenet Corporation with an enhanced ability to obtain federal contracts through the 8A set-aside program, and in connection with government-owned contractor-operated GOCO facilities. 4. The Wakenet Cabazan joint venture was intended to support the needs of a number of foreign governments and forces, including forces and governments in Central America and the Middle East. The Contras in Nicaragua represented one of the most important priorities for the joint venture. 5. The Wakenet Cabazan joint venture maintained close liaison with certain elements of the United States government, including representatives of intelligence, military and law enforcement agencies. 6. Among the frequent visitors to the Wakenet Cabazan joint venture were Peter Vidanix of the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., and a close associate of Vidanix by the name of L. W. Bryan. Bryan is a private businessman who lives in Maryland and who has maintained close ties with the U.S. intelligence community for many years. 7. In connection with my work for Wakenet, I engaged in some software development and modification work in 1983 and 1984 on the proprietary Promise computer software product. The copy of Promise on which I worked came from the U.S. Department of Justice. L. W. Bryan made it available to me through Wakenet after acquiring it from Peter Vidanix, who was then a Department of Justice contracting official with responsibility for the Promise software. I performed the modifications to Promise in Indio. California, Silver Spring, Maryland, and Miami, Florida. 8. The purpose of the Promise software modifications that I made in 1983 and 1984 was to support a plan for the implementation of Promise in law enforcement and intelligence agencies worldwide. L. W. Bryan was spearheading the plan for this worldwide use of the Promise computer software. 9. Some of the modifications that I made were specifically designed to facilitate the implementation of Promise within two agencies of the Government of Canada. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, and the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, CSIS. L. W. Bryan would check with me from time to time to make certain that the work would be completed in time to satisfy the schedule for the RCMP and CSIS implementations of Promise. 10. The proprietary version of Promise, as modified by me, was, in fact, implemented in both the RCMP and the CSIS in Canada. It was my understanding that L. W. Bryan had sold this version of Promise to the Government of Canada. 11. In February 1991, I had a telephone conversation with Peter Vidanix, then still employed by the U.S. Department of Justice. 
Vidinix attempted during this telephone conversation to persuade me not to cooperate with an independent investigation of the government's piracy of Inslaw's proprietary promise software being conducted by the Committee on the Judiciary of the U.S. House of Representatives. 12. Vidinix stated that I would be rewarded for a decision not to cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee investigation. Vidinix forecasted an immediate and favorable resolution of a protracted child custody dispute being prosecuted against my wife by her former husband, if I were to decide not to cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee investigation. 13. Vidinix also outlined specific punishments that I could expect to receive from the U.S. Department of Justice if I cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee's investigation. 14. One punishment that Vidinix outlined was the future inclusion of me and my father in a criminal prosecution of certain business associates of mine in Orange County, California, in connection with the operation of a savings and loan institution in Orange County. By way of underscoring his power to influence such decisions at the U.S. Department of Justice, Vidinix informed me of the indictment of these business associates prior to the time when that indictment was unsealed and made public. 15. Another punishment that Vidinix threatened against me if I cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee is prosecution by the U.S. Department of Justice for perjury. Vidinix warned me that credible witnesses would come forward to contradict any damaging claims that I made in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee, and that I would subsequently be prosecuted for perjury by the U.S. Department of Justice for my testimony before the House Judiciary Committee. Danny Casalaro was, of course, intent on interviewing Peter Vidinix. A strange coincidence occurred during the week prior to his death. While sitting in a pub, having a beer, a man named Joseph Quayler approached him and they began talking. At some point during the conversation, Danny disclosed the contents of his investigation and expressed a desire to interview Peter Vidinix. To Danny's astonishment, Quayler, claiming to be a special forces operative, said he could arrange a rendezvous between Peter Vidinix and Casalaro. Quayla's connection to Peter Vidinix allegedly came through Vidinix's wife, Barbara, who was the executive assistant to the powerful West Virginia Democratic Senator, Robert Byrd. Byrd played a major role in the effort to have the CIA move some of its administrative offices to Charlestown, 20 miles from Martinsburg, on the Virginia border. It was apparently through Barbara Vidinix that Quayler intended to arrange the interview. Casalara confided to friends that he was unnerved by this supposedly chance meeting. He met with Quayler at other times that week, but it is unknown whether he ever spoke with Vidinix. To date, that question remains unanswered. Significantly, Elliot Richardson, the respected former U.S. Attorney General representing Inslaw, called for the appointment of a special counsel to look into the death of Casalaro. That did not occur, but some of the positive fallout from Richardson's request came back in the form of sources who allegedly knew Quayler. One source said Quayler was a U.S. Army major, Army Intelligence Unit, who went to work for a company that was a DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, cut out. One FBI agent said Quayler reportedly spoke Arabic fluently and had spent time in Iraq.